for food. Yeah. So this is section in your book, in uh, the Triola book. This is section 9.1, where we are doing hypothesis testing. So HT hypothesis testing, but for two proportions. So in all of chapter 8 in your book, you did hypothesis testing, and you did hypothesis testing for uh, population proportion, and then we did hypothesis testing, you know, making claims about a population mean, and there were two situations with a population mean, whether sigma was known or sigma was unknown. So those were the three situations that we did in, ch in chapter 8. Chapter 9, we are doing proportions and means again, but for two. So two proportions, two means. Now, for two proportions, you know, there's no special situation, right? When we have two means, then we have to, you know, talk about two different scenarios. But for two proportions, it's pretty straight. Um, you know, because you have two proportions, you have uh, different notation. So like N1 would be, you know, your sample size for the first sample because I'm going to have two of them. So N2 would be for the second sample. Um, X1 would be the number of successes in that sample size for the first sample. So X2 would be the number of successes for the second sample. So P1 hat would be the sample proportion for the first sample, which you know we can calculate by doing X1 over N1 if you ever do that. And P2 hat would be the sample proportion for the second um, sample. Um, Q1 hat is the obviously the complement of P1 hat and Q2 hat, 1 minus P2 hat. Um, P1 is the population proportion for the first, so prop proportion for the first population. P2 is the second population proportion. Q2 is 1 minus, I'm sorry, Q1. All these one things go with the first sample and the first population. Q1 is 1 minus P1, so it's like so if this is the uh, probability of success for the first population, this is the probability of failure, which is the complement for the first population, and then Q2 for the second population. So all the subscripts 1 for the first sample of first population, and then the subscripts 2 for the second sample or second population. Um, I'm going to show you the calculator trick for this just because the formula is kind of long and tedious. This is really where you get happy that you have the calculator trick instead of the formula because the formula is really long just for the test statistic for this. Um, to, uh, to actually, um, everything is in the same location that we've been in before. So actually, let me show you this and you guys can just take a guess as to what you're going to use for this. So we go to stat for everything, right? And over to tests and so think about what you might use so we've we've done one prop z test we've done t test and z test right um so one prop z test was for a single proportion um running a test and then if we scroll down to all the interval stuff right we did one prop z int and we did t interval and z interval for intervals confidence intervals which we could also use to um run a, a, t a test but um, so one prop Z int was for a single proportion. You know, we were doing a confidence interval. So you can imagine that if I have one sample versus two, two prop Z int, or if I go up here, um, two prop Z test would be what I use when I have um, a hypothesis test regarding a um, two proportions. So two oops, prop Z test. For, so two prop z test uh, that's sloppy but if I'm looking for a test statistic or a p-value right um, remember that the calculator trick that we use for hypothesis testing or that ends in test gives us a test statistic or a p-value and if I want a confidence interval which we could also use to run a test we don't we go to two prop z int for this right so it's not really very different to what we've done before. It's just starting with two instead of one because now I have two proportions, two samples, two different um, populations. So looking at an example, um, so Oxycontin is a drug used to treat pain, but it is well known for its addictiveness and danger. In a clinical trial among subjects treated with this, 52 developed nausea and 175 did not develop nausea. Um, among, among other subjects given placebos, five developed nausea and 40 did not develop nausea. 
um, use a 0 0.05 significance level to test a claim. So first of all, I hope you guys can recognize the difference between this and what we've done before because you can hear that there are two situations. I have people who were treated and people who were given placebos and information from each of those situations. So um, I always say define your populations and your samples, one versus two now, and then you use that to represent all your notation when you write your, uh, your claim and all that later. So the first I'll do, I'll call the treatment group. So this is population one, sample one, and then sample two, population two is the placebo group. And once I have that now labeling, my, my variables is going to be a little bit easier. So the ones treated with Oxycontin, 52 of them developed nausea and 175 did not develop nausea. Um, now, you know, we're talking about the rates of nausea. So if I'm talking about rates of nausea, then remember I said um, X, the number of successes, doesn't have to be the better situation. It just has to be what you're running a test about or what you want. And in this case, we're talking about nausea. So the success would be the amount of people developing nausea here. So the number of successes in end trial. So how many total subjects did I have that were in the treatment group? So 52 developed nausea and 175 did not. So that's not my total. 52 plus 175 is my total. Um, outside of that, um, the number of successes would be the number that developed nausea based on how we define success and what we want. So how many developed nausea? 52. So X1, right, the subscript 1, comes from my first sample, my first, which is the treatment group. And this is how many total, um, total subjects in that sample, and then 52 total successes in that sample. So Again, what am I doing? I hear or I read my situation and I realize I have more than one case. And so now I know that I'm either gonna do two proportions or two means, let's say. So how do I know which one I'm gonna do? Well, I'm testing a claim between the rates of nausea. Rates, um, not means, right? Rates, proportions. So let me identify my stuff. So first I gotta say, well, which one is sample one? Which one is sample two? Which one's population one? Which one's population two? Remember what they are. Let's find all my information. I'm not gonna find P1 hat because the calculator is gonna do that for me, but it would be X1 over N1. So this is the proportion of people in the treatment group that, that develop nausea, yeah. Because of the, um, we want to know the rates of nausea. So nausea is our success. Remember I said, so yeah, success doesn't have to be the better situation. It's just a matter of what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we were going to say, like, find the difference between the rates of non-nausea or whatever, then I would make success that. But I mean, you could do either one. Just remember which one it is because that will change your situation a little bit. Um, I just go with what I want to run the test on. So that's my success. Okay. My placebo group, N2, um, I have five that developed nausea and 40 that did not. So I have 45 total in that group. And then X2, the number of successes, in, in this case, developed nausea, five of them. We know that's not success, but you know what I mean. X2 over N2 for P2, right? P2 hat. Um, I don't, I'm not going to find, you know, the calculator does that for me. So let's, what else do I need? I need alpha. Alpha is the significance level, which is given to be 0 0.05, right? Um, and then I need the actual test, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So now, you have to remember what you're defining to be group one and group two. Use a 0 0.05 significance level to test for a difference between the rates of nausea for those treated with Oxycontin and those given a placebo. Is there a difference or is there not? P1 represents the proportion for the population. So for the population of treatment groups, because remember one is my treatment group. So if I have a subscript of one, I'm referring to this group. So my proportion from the po population of treatment, people who take Oxycontin, Oxycontin, whatever the population is defined to be, the people who take oxycodone, um, that the proportion of them who develop nausea. That's what P1 hat, or P1 represents. P2 represents the, um, P2 
people in the, in a group from the population that were tr that were treated with the placebo, right? They got a placebo, um, and the percentage of them or the proportion of them that developed nausea. That's what P two means. You have to know what the variables represent for your situation, because otherwise it's going to be way harder if you don't. So I'm comparing two population proportions. This population that took the drug and got nausea, and this that took the drug, uh, took the placebo and got nauseous, the proportion out of the total for the population. I want to know if there's a difference. So are they the same or are they not the same? So this is a two-tailed test, right? I have two rejection regions. I have, I mean, I don't know, whatever we are going to find. Um, I'll probably try to do everything. So now I have my, ulti my hypothesis. I'm going to read it one more time, make sure everything makes sense. Oxycontin is a drug used to treat pain. It is well known for its addictiveness and danger. In a clinical trial among um, subjects treated, 52 developed nausea and 175 did not. So 227 total and 52 were success because we're talking nausea, uh, nausea. Among other subjects given placebos, 5 developed nausea, 40 did not. So 45 total, but 5 of them had success, quote unquote. Use a 0 0.05 significance level to test for a difference, whether they're the same or not, for those treated with oxycodone and, and those given a placebo. So again, it is the proportion from the population who took the drug and developed nausea the same or not the same as those who took the placebo and um, developed nausea. Okay, that's what that means. You have to understand what the notation means because you have to interpret it after. Two-tailed test. So if we're going to find the test statistic, which is a z-score when we deal with proportions, we're going to find the p-value, which every time I want a test statistic or a p-value, I'm going to use the calculator trick. And for this, it would be two um, prop z-tests, and I'll do that in a second. Um, and then what else do I want? The critical value, actually, that you're stuck kind of going through a process, um, which is a z-score because we're dealing with proportions, so that's an inverse norm, if you remember that. And then what else do I want? I guess we could find the confidence interval. So we're going to need the confidence level based on that. So tell me, um, how do I determine the confidence level? You guys remember? I think we talked about it last week. Let me see if I can find that. How do I determine the confidence level if I want to um, run a test? and use the confidence interval method to do that. So there is a way that we um, determined when we had a com uh, confidence interval. Let me see if I can find that in my notes for you guys. You're thinking in the right, you're thinking in the right direction um, the confidence level is always the complement of, let me see if I can find it here. This is from the last thing that we did. Oh, here. Okay. So remember this, if we're doing a confidence interval method, if I have a two-tailed test, then the confidence level is just the complement of alpha. But if I have a one-tailed test, then the confidence level is one minus twice alpha. So to determine the confidence level, if it's not given to me, I have to determine what kind of test, if it's two or if it's one. Oops, sorry. Right, so if it's two-tailed, the confidence level is one minus alpha. If it's one-tailed, the confidence level is one minus twice alpha. So it's depending on the type of test that I have. Um, so in this case, we have a two-tailed test. So if I'm not given the confidence level, in this case, one minus alpha. So let's go back here. So my alpha is 0 0.05. So my confidence level is 1 minus 0 0.05, which is 0.95. So I want a 95% confidence interval for the situation. You know, if I'm using that method, I'm just going to do all this stuff and then, you know, whatever uh, method we want after that is easy. So, all right, to my calculator, I'm going to go through all of it one shot. So let's go to stat over to test and we'll do the test statistic and the p-value first. So two prop z tests. I want to end in test for test statistic and p-value. And you'll see that it asks for this stuff. So you have to know what the heck this is. 
right? So we define X1 to be the uh, from the treatment group, right? So 52 got nauseous, uh, nauseous from the treatment group that had the oxy, uh, oxycodone um, or took the drug. N1 is the total, 227. X2 is the um, amount of them who got nauseous from the placebo group, which was 5 out of 45, so 5 and then 45 total for that group. It was a two-tailed test, so highlight that. This is not very different from what we did before. It's just now you have more variables, so you have to know what they mean. And here's all the stuff that pops up. So this is not different in terms of the output than what we've done before either. The first one is the alternative hypothesis. Are they, you know, not the same, not equal to? This is the test statistic, right? So there's always this order. Alternative hypothesis, test statistic, p-value. See, it gives me p1 hat and p2 hat. That's why I didn't really do it, because it gives me that. p hat, this is a population purport. You're not going to use that value. And then it just, you know, you can double check your n1 and n2 if you want. So I'm going to take the first two values. If I need p1 hat and p2 hat, I'll grab that. But I'm just going to take the test statistic and p-value, write those down. So the test statistic was, was it one point? So rounding to the nearest um, uh, hundredth, 1.78. And then the p-value was approximately 0 0.0757. So, all right, let's go into the confidence interval. I want a 95% confidence interval. So I'm going back to stat over to test. I want an interval. So I got to go down past all this stuff that ends in test to the stuff that ends in inter interval. And I want two, two, prob two probs the int. Because I want two, I'm dealing with two proportions. So let's go down to two probs the int. You'll notice it already has the stuff in it from what I just did. My C level was 0.95, so let's change that. Not much difference like in terms of input, it's, it's just new variables. And then output, and it gives me my interval. Give me P1 hat, P2 hat also, give me N1, N2. So this is my interval from 0, .0 let me write that down. So 0 0.0111 to 0 0.2248, and I wanna explain what that represents also in a second. Talk about that in a second. But let me, what else? Let's do the critical value also. Um, I'm not gonna, I guess I'll quickly draw it for you. I want you guys to be able to do this without drawing it. But anyway, so I'm on an SND curve, right? It's a two-tailed test, so two rejection regions, one here, one here. So I have two critical values for this. And then I have one here in the left tail and one in the right tail. Remember that we split alpha in two pieces because we have two tails. So 0 0.025 here and 0 0.025 here. So inverse norm, I can just put 0 0.025 and then get the left tailed critical value, which will also give me the right tailed because they are the same value, just opposites because it's symmetric. So I'm gonna go second bars for that, inverse norm, because I'm on an SND curve. The area what was 0 0.025. Mean and standard deviation is one because of the fact that I'm on an SND curve, right? We remember that from chapter six. And then my critical value is negative 1.96. That's the left-tailed, and then I need the right-tailed also. So it's going to be just plus and minus um, 1.96 for my critical value. That's one. <laughs> so this is 1.96, and this is negative 1.96. Um, so looking at this, actually, before I do anything, even using the p-value method, you can see that the p-value is bigger than alpha. What does it mean when the p-value is bigger than alpha? Um, what's my conclusion? I'm failing to reject, so I don't think I have space. So my conclusion is failing to reject the null. I'm failing to reject the null. Just remember that if I have a two-tailed test, Right? I can interpret this different ways. Re remember what the null says. So the null says that the two things are equal. The two population proportions are equal. There's also another way to interpret this. If I move this around a little bit and I write P1 minus P2 equal to zero, it's the same thing. Because if the difference is equal to zero, that means that the two numbers are the same. Right? Or the difference, if the difference between the two values is not equal to zero, then that means that they're not equal to each other. So you might see it written this way, you might see it written this way, but they mean the same thing, correct? So if I'm failing to reject this, 
right? There are we different ways I can write this. So uh, I'm going to go based on just failing to reject this. That means that I'm going to, there's sufficient evidence to support this because I'm failing to reject it. And so there's sufficient evidence to support the claim. I'll take that up. I'm not gonna... That, and then, you know, the words, I'm going to go back into the problem and look at. So there is. So, so, Sufficient evidence to support the claim that, I'm supporting the claim that the null, right? What does the null say? That the two proportions are the same. That there is no difference between the rates of nausea. I'm just going to copy that down. But it says that they're the same. So that there is no difference. To support the claim that there is no difference between, and I'm just really going to copy, I would copy and paste, but I can't, between the rates of nausea for those treated, between the rates for those uh, developing nausea, for those treated with oxy, and those not, or given the placebo, right? I mean, I can also say that the percentage for the population, the proportion for the population that developed nausea who were given the treatment is the same as the, um, the percentage for the population or the proportion for the population that were given the placebo, which implies, right, that, you know, this drug does not create or, you know, nausea because it's not necessarily more common than if, you know, those have, that were given the placebo. Now, I'm not saying that they sampled enough or we don't know how they sampled. I'm not saying the way they sampled or if they had a big enough sample size. You know, all that is different, right? All that is another kind of like idea that we have to think about whether or not all this makes, means anything. You know, if it was sampled incorrectly, then it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, you might need a bigger sample size here. It all depends on like, what you're going to do with this. You know, FDA, actually, when they do these kind of tests for FDA approval, they have a lot of requirements that have to be met. So did they meet them? I don't know. But, you know, based on what we have, if everything is good to go, then we can say that, okay, this is a, you know, this drug is not creating nausea more than, you know, if you were just taking a placebo, if that makes sense. Um, real quick uh, about the confidence interval, then you guys can ask me questions. Um, I'm not going to go into so much detail every time, but I want you guys to understand it. I want you to know what the confidence interval represents. So we're basically running a test about the difference in mathematics, difference, subtraction. So this confidence interval represents the difference between the two proportions. That means that I'm taking the percentage or the decimal, right, for the population proportion of treatment groups and subtracting from that the percentage or the proportion from the placebo group for the population and then this interval represents the numbers that are possible for the population difference between those two. So this is not P1 and P2, this is an interval from 0 0.01 to 0 0.22. This is an interval of numbers representing this difference, subtracting the two population proportions. That's what this confidence interval represents when you have more than one um, value. If I'm using this test, the confidence interval method, to test the claim, you can see that the difference on the null is equal to zero, right? If the difference between the two, subtraction, if I subtract two numbers and I get zero, that means they're the same, right? That means they're the same, they're equal. Well, zero is not a possibility, is it, um, for this. Now, you get some interesting situations that happen sometimes where the confidence interval uh, method, so like in this case, the confidence interval method, if I look at the difference, it does not contain zero. Zero is not in this interval. It's not a possibility for the population. So did I make a mistake doing my confidence interval or not? I don't know. We could look at that. But sometimes this happens. If zero is not here, that's not a possibility for the population. You see this? That means according to the confidence interval method, I would reject my null. 
um, it does not match what we did with the other two methods. But you can see that, first of all, you know, is there error in this um, test? Well, the confidence, uh, the critical value is not very far away from the test statistic. They're very close numbers, 1.78 versus 1.96. They're very close um, numbers. This is not in the um, rejection region, so again, we would fail to reject. But since they're so close, I would look at my sample size. Look, this has five out of 45 versus 52 out of 227 people in this group and 45. There might be some error with how they sampled their stuff. So then they might have to go back and look at the information in the original stuff and did they sample it correct? Did they have a big enough sample size? And look at that. Um, so it is rare. Most of the time these will match for you guys at least because everything should work out perfectly. But I wanted to show situations that are possible. Sometimes the method, the confidence interval method doesn't necessarily match maybe the p-value method or the traditional method, only based on the fact that this is a possibility for the population. You know, this is running a test comparing two values. Obviously, there's error um, in, in hypothesis testing, and obviously, we'd have to sample and do things correctly initially um, to be able to have this make sense or mean anything. But um, just in case you see that situation, most of the time for you guys, everything's going to match up perfectly because um, you'll have nice situations. But I wanted to show examples. Now, I said a lot. So uh, questions. Questions about 